All right, welcome panel. Uh, it's good to see you all this morning, day two here. This is the panel on agriculture and utilities economic opportunity. Uh, during the symposium so far, we've heard references to the need for a change workforce to support the innovations and technologies of the new economy. We've heard references made to jobs that haven't existed, like drone pilots, and the modes of working that differ greatly from what's come before. If you pull up a mental picture of an agricultural workforce, for example, I expect it includes fields with large number of laborers planting, weeding, and harvesting. This old model is rapidly waning, and we want to know more about what it's going to be replaced by. In this panel, we want to drill down into the changing needs for the workforce, uh, what is needed from it, where it will come from, how it will get developed, what the workers need to be able to do. And we want to hear that from directly from the companies that will be and are employing that workforce. To discuss these issues, our panelists this morning are Rusty Vance, the manager of UAV flight operations at Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E's challenges in monitoring its 40,000 miles of transmission lines in the state of California were mentioned yesterday. Much of this transmission infrastructure is legacy from other companies that PG&E has acquired over the years and is aging and very difficult to monitor and maintain. And Rusty is bringing drone technology to meet that challenge. We have Pauline Cantonor, Chief of Staff at FarmWise. Pauline comes, as, comes to us from a ranch in the northeastern part of France. Uh, Pauline joined, joined the FarmWise team four years ago and has been wearing many hats since. She oversees marketing and business development and helps the company raise money. She loves understanding growers' challenges and strategizing ways that FarmWise core technology can help them be more efficient. FarmWise is a leading company in ag tech, having released its third generation of AI-powered weeding robots, its Titan EF35, which was up on the screen uh, in Josh's introduction this morning, uh, well-named as a Titan as it weighs in at three tons. This machine is a marvel of machine vision, machine learning, and mechanical precision. We also have Dennis Donahue, the innovation lead at Western Growers. Dennis has a deep leadership history in Salinas Valley Ag. As the president of Royal Rose LLC, a grower in the valley, he's also past mayor of the city of Salinas. Where he is now, the Western Growers Center for Innovation and Technology has become a world-leading center for ag innovation, providing a gateway for innovative companies to reach the ag community. Dennis's leadership in the creation and ongoing development of the center have put him at the center of ag innovation and in contact with a variety of ag tech companies with a deep knowledge of the current and future challenges faced by growers. I want to begin the panel by giving them the opportunity to introduce themselves and their companies and provide their perspectives on the workforce needs and challenges of their companies. We'll follow this with a discussion of workforce development issues. Please submit your questions on Slido. We'll be looking for those. And we'll finish with a set of closing statements. So let us begin, and let me call on Rusty to start us off and tell us about what you're up to at PG&E. Yeah, thank you, Brad. Appreciate it. Uh, it's nice being here. A uh, nice little uh, change from the weather up in uh, Redding, where I'm from. So it's uh, a little nicer to be on the coast. So uh, at PG&E, uh, you know, as Brad mentioned, a lot of transmission lines that are being inspected, and that was kind of um, that was kind of the initial purpose of when UAVs, when drones really came on PG&E property. Um, and so at any given time, um, we could have anywhere from, from 10 to 160, 170 drones on PG&E property uh, doing inspections. Um, I came into the UAV group um, earlier this year, and where we decided that we really wanted to drive 
PG&E with UAV, UAS use is more than just inspections. So with inspections, um, there's a lot of work. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and, and we're getting out there. We're, we're checking the infrastructure. We're ensuring things are safe. We're providing an extra layer of safety to the community by getting these. But there's so many more opportunities within the utility to bring innovation and technology um, and provide that value. So I'm going to go over a few different slides here and kind of cover what we're doing. Um, and this is just, this is very high level. Um, it doesn't even, it leaves out a lot, but I'll try to, to cover for the most part. So internally on our team, you know, we cover, you know, we go through construction documentation. We have a lot of different substation projects or facility projects that are going on. Our team goes out, uses imagery to provide documentation of the process of it. Uh, solar farms, we inspect panel health. Um, hydro structures, we have a lot of work up in the mountains. You know, pg e has a lot of uh, areas that are very difficult to access, and so we're able to use the UAVs to get up in there. Um, and I've got a picture in a little bit of a drone we actually use to fly into the, the very tall penstocks to um, actually get inside and inspect inside. Uh, land survey mapping, 360 degree mapping, um, structure inspections, so bridges, uh, towers, substations. Um, we're just now diving into distribution structure inspections, infrastructure, and then gas department corrosion inspections, and we also do gas methane detection as well. Um, environmental impact and geological, geological study support is something we do. Uh, and then the wildfire safety inspection program, that was 2019, that was what kicked off all of the drones, you know, post, of the, post the major fires, the wildfire safety inspection program came um, and became an initiative, and that's when everything really kicked off with the drones, and, and what we found was the amount of damage that a drone can find on a structure versus somebody flying in a helicopter or even somebody climbing the structure and looking at it, uh, the drones are just able to get so much better footage um, and we're able to find more things. And so in turn, you know, getting things, getting the problem solved faster, getting everything fixed and, and making everything safer. Uh, enterprise uh, emergencies, so, you know, storm damage, fire restoration. This year after fires, we're using the drones to do post-restoration inspections to make sure everything's safe before they re-energize. Um, we are currently working through, you may have seen in the new, or you know, it, somewhere that we are working through beyond visual line of sight. Um, we've acquired waivers for beyond visual line of sight for all of our high fire risk um, areas within PG&E, so for the entire service territory, and that's allowing us to, to really grow what our inspections look like, what our opportunities for inspections, and really setting a, setting a base layer for the future of what we can develop and where we can take this technology. Because uh, obviously getting the waiver is just the first step, and then we have to you know, show how we can apply that and, and grow with it. Uh, we have a UAS training within our, in, within our system, um, and we train pg and &E employees that aren't technically drone pilots by background. They, have a, they serve another role within pg and &E, but we train them and certify them to be drone pilots on pg and &E property so that they can use small personal drones to get their work done, keep them a little bit safer, um, and still provide value. And then R&D projects, so one of my, you know, my team is, is big on anything and everything we can do, we can bring to the company that's going to provide value, add safety, uh, we, we want to try it out. So R&D is a really big thing um, that keeps us busy. So right here, you know, like I said, at pg &E, everyone and everything is always safe. And so that's a major part of what we use for drones. Um, on, I guess it would be your guys' left, um, on the left, there's that, that top picture on the top left, that's the top of a penstock. That's a 400 foot, basically straight up and down. You can see on the bottom left where they're climbing up it with ropes to get to the top of it. Traditionally, we would have to send employees down into these to inspect them. Um, and now we're able to use a drone to get in there, do the inspections, um, and keep our employees safe and get them out of those confined space areas. Over on the right is a drone with a gas methane detection. And this is along the Carquinas Bridge, and we're able to use that drone rather than having to have employees walk out there along the Carquinas Bridge within traffic or, you know, safety at heights or be on a boat. 
we're able to use the drones to do those same inspections. So these are some of the, the R&D projects that we bring in to, to add safety to our employees. And then, you know, at pg and &E, we stand by being curious, tenacious, and nimble. Um, and this system right here, this is the InfraVision system out of Australia. I just recently brought this into pg and &E, and what it does is it uses a drone to pull rope and string rope and wire along the top of towers. So where traditional methods were with a helicopter or doing it by hand, um, now we're able to use it by drones. Um, it flies and it can go over the top. We recently did a project in Vallejo, 44,000 feet over the top of neighborhoods, nursing homes, um, all these different communities where we had zero impact to the community, zero impact to the residents, and we're able to get the job done safely and with minimal risk. So um, at pg and &E, you know, we have not only are we trying to bring in what's currently working for someone else, how can we bring it to pg and &E? we're really trying to lead the industry and, and see what we can do to, to be the leading utility with UAV use. Excellent. Thank you very much. It's just fascinating how, how much drones are, are being integrated into the everyday work process. They're not this special thing anymore. They are a part of the process in, in all things. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of the, the biggest problems, and it's a really good problem that I have right now, is the biggest problem is anytime somebody comes up with an idea at pg and &E within any of our lines of business, the first question that comes to mind is, well, can we do it with a drone? And, and so, you know, like I said, it's, it's a big problem because we're always trying to solve it, and sometimes the answer is no, it's not the best solution, but there's a lot of opportunities that it is. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to Pauline and Farmwise. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. I apologize for not having slides. Uh, I'm in the post-slide era, uh, or rather, I haven't prepared my slides today. I would encourage you to check out the LinkedIn page of Farmwise or Instagram account to see a bunch of video at Farmwise Labs. Um, I, so I'm the chief of staff. I've been overseeing many different departments for the company, uh, and today we are about 65 people. We raised a bunch of money uh, from inception up until now, from traditional venture capital firms to more strategic in the space of agriculture, um, specifically. And we have a, a good split between, I'd say, like engineers from four different kinds of group from mechanical, hardware, to computer vision, and then we have the second half of the team is more coming from a deep agricultural background and knowledge of agricultural operations and processes. Um, what we do is we are in business to help growers transition in an era where there are less and less resources available or where we want to be more careful and cautious with the resources that we use. And we leverage um, you know, all kinds of technologies to make that happen, uh, particularly computer vision and robotics. We started working on a first kind of challenge, um, automating the very labor intensive weed control practices that are at play today in the produce industry, which we are surrounded by in the beautiful Monterey Bay. Um, and, and so the, we came up with a couple of prototypes up until today that and, and the latest generation we do run as a service to large growing operations, names that you probably have heard of, like Taylor, Taylor Farms client. Um, you know, you may, may or may not know the label Earthbound Organics. Uh, you may buy it at Safeway or Whole Foods. And, and so we help them really automate that process of hand weeding. And, and so our, our machines uses computer vision, so plant recognition, so it's like object detection, what people do to automate navigation of, of cars on the open road. But we detect plants, uh, we detect not just the plant or the species, but we detect where the Mary stem, the center of the crop is located. And we also draw the contour, the perimeter of the plant itself, and that allows us to calibrate mechanical tools and traditional tooling with high precision. So we are weeding essentially the entire bed of crops um, in between the crops and in between the rows of crops. So we essentially combine a standard cultivation pass with a hand weeding pass. Um, these, these jobs are traditionally done by, by humans, so you will have crews of 15 to 25 people walking a field with hose, 
uh, maybe some of you have done that uh, for their summer uh, as a child. And we, growers will also use standard cultivators, cultivators so really dumb, quote unquote, non-camera guided cultivation implements, which will clean in between the rows of crops. Um, and so what we're seeing today is that the supply of farm workers, the availability of field labor to conduct these physically taxing, um, repetitive and low paying jobs are, um, is just less and less. And, and so there is a need to find solutions for growers to maintain the wheat pressure low. Um, Cause as you know, weeds, weeds compete with crops for water like nutrients and you know you got to keep your wheat pressure down if you want to enhance yield and you know bring this this field to harvest in the best way possible um, and and what we're seeing in other adjacent industries such as you know commodity crop like corn soybeans this process has been automated through chemistry um, sprayers blanketing the field with with herbicides we have very little availability of chemistry in the produce industry um, and the availability the proximity with countries like Mexico has kind of not really encouraged us to fund mechanization in the space. And we think that with AI, we're really, you know, arriving at a moment where we can bring affordable technologies to farmers to automate or mechanize that process. So that's what we're doing. Um, today we have 14 Titan machines that you saw on the screen. Um, we run them as a service fleet. So growers will call us, hey, I have 15 acres of broccoli to be weeded this week. We show up with our own truck, trailer, operator. The machine is today not auto autonomous. We've made the choice over the journey to stop uh, funding autonomy, but rather invest in really nailing down the automation of hand weeding. That's two different problems, and I think there's value in focus, uh, which is what we decided to do. So we have an operator following the machine, controlling weeding quality, making sure everything's all right, and we are offer the best quality for the grower. Um, then the machine is brought back to the shop. We have our facility in Salinas, and then we bill the grower for a fee, flat fee per acre for the job. We handle today 14 different commodities from lettuce to cauliflower, broccoli, celery, artichokes, radicchio, and we keep adding more crops to the list. The goal is really to be able to support the large outfit we work with on all the program they, they work on. There are some crops for which it's the, feasibility, the technical feasibility will be limited, but we, are, such as spinach, for obvious reasons, it's very dense um, versus a lettuce, which is a more spacious field that allow um, cultivation or soil disruption. But we're really trying to like address most of their needs uh, on the on the weed control side. We're also working on a next generation of machine, uh, which will be also a revolution of a design for us. And we think that we have a, a really wonderful vision for the next few years on this product and the ability to take it even to a further level. So I'm very excited to see that coming to life and do you know first field testing in a few weeks and, and release the product commercially next year. It will be a pull behind implement. So we're dropping the concept of a fully autonomous weeding robot and, and really trying to insert ourselves in the most reliable, efficient way into growers' operation while keeping the core technology, which is plant, plant detection, real-time actuation on the field. So we're collecting data, processing it locally in real time thanks to onboarded compute, and then we trigger action out in the field. That's what we're good at, and so that's what we're trying to bring forward into this um, new farming implement. That's great. I, I can't imagine a more... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can't imagine a more stark example of a complete change in what the workers need to be doing from the the old process to the new. And I know it warms Dennis's heart to hear you say that you cover radicchio. <laughs> well, you know, now now that I'm at Western Western Growers, I think about fresh fruits, vegetables, and nuts. I I can no longer afford to limit myself to radicchio and my. <laughs> Uh, you know, my hope that one day it will overtake kale, but uh, 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 but Pauline warms my heart because she's a resident of the Innovation Center, and uh, and she's a, thank you for being a perfect setup artist. Uh, so, uh, what I'd like to do real quickly, because Brad's got a good set of questions, I know you all want to want to hear about. Uh, so I uh, run Western Growers Center for Innovation and Technology. Uh, I was a grower shipper, and as we like to say in Salinas, I was in the deal for 30 years. 
uh, and I belong to a number of uh, the, tra the trade groups, PMA, United, et cetera, and Western Growers. And I think, arguably, Western Growers uh, is one of the more critical entities for the future of the, of, of the region uh, because uh, we, we for, for a couple of reasons. One, we represent uh, the multi-generational family farming corporations and uh, uh, in California, Arizona, Colorado, and we threw in the uh, New Mexico Chili Pepper uh, Association for good measure. But th our, gr our group represents about 50 plus percent uh, of North America's fresh fruit and vegetable um, and nut production and a, and a comparable amount uh, on, on organics as well. And then our, our members need to be in the marketplace on a year-round basis. And so in order to get that done, we're sourcing from some 32 different states and 20, di 20 different countries. Uh, so, it's, so it's a big footprint. And, uh, um, and so in the, in the specialty crop world, uh, you know, part, part of our role is to work with companies like FarmWise and help them scale. You, you come to Salinas, but we can help broaden the network. So I think Western Growers uh, made an unusual but a significant and an important move uh, on behalf of the industry uh, six years ago when it opened up the center uh, to, to actually jump into the game beyond advocacy and general service and, and try and be a hub where we could actually connect solution providers with our growers. And, and I tell companies like FarmWise, you know, our, we were supporting, as you can tell listening to Pauline and the description of the company, they, they know what they're doing, but we can help provide business services. And so really our role uh, where we can is to connect uh, technology with growers. And when we got started, we had three primary er er areas of interest. There was a drought then, there's a drought now, so water's on our mind. Uh, labor has been an ongoing issue, as you heard uh, Pauline lay out. And, uh, and over the past couple of years, that's been a bit of a fire drill, except water has moved back in, back in front. Uh, but water is really kind of the setup for uh, the third area of uh, big data and precision ag, because that's, that's where you bring it all, uh, a lot of the uh, um, elements together around how do you do more with less? And then that speaks to all the tools that go along with uh, um, data, et, et, et cetera. So, but uh, what, what I would say is our, our role is to try and help folks cross the finish line. There are a lot of incubators and accelerators uh, but we're, we, we see our role as a, a little different. And I think that's good uh, for the region because when you're a center of gravity, so to speak, um, then you know, that creates some scale opportunities for, uh, for our, our local, um, um, for the folks who are coming into the area and trying to make technology happen, just like we heard with Joby. We're trying to do the same thing in terms of ag tech. Great, thank you very much, Dennis. Excellent. So. Let me pose uh, to you all, um, you know, one of the, uh, the management decisions that, that always has to be made is the, uh, the make or buy decision. And so as you look at the workforce and you look at the skills that you need now versus what was needed in the past, what are those skills that are needed now? What, uh, what do workers need to have? And what of those skills can be made, that is trained within your company, trained on the job, and what need to be bought, that is what need to, what do workers need to arrive at your company with. Uh, and, and one of the things that I think would be interesting here is that that might be very, a very different answer for a large established company like PG&E versus a startup with far fewer resources like FarmWise. So, we, we may have a difference there. Interested to hear about that. Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and start with that. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I've always really enjoyed about PG&E is it's a place of opportunity for all walks of life. Uh, you know, somebody with several degrees, college experience, um, we've got a job for you, right? Uh, somebody straight off the street 
and needing opportunities for training and wants to get into a good career that they can retire from without necessarily, and, and maybe doesn't have the opportunities to get those degrees or, or go to the schooling, uh, there's jobs for that as well. And so uh, one of the things we look for in a workforce, me specifically, is, is the right mindset, the right attitude. Uh, you know, no matter the background, no matter the, no matter the job background, no matter the schooling, or lack thereof, uh, with the right mindset, uh, I could, we can mold anybody into, the, into that employee that um, can get the job done safely, effectively for us, and, and really grow with the company. Um, you know, as a company, when I mentioned growing, you know, we're always wanting to get to that next step. We want to be able to provide energy safer for our communities and for our employees. And in order to do that, you have to be able to take that mindset of this is how we've always done it and push that aside and, and understand that we're going to take a step in a different direction. Um, and so for me, uh, you know, we have that opportunity. I think, like you said, being the bigger corporation and having so many different avenues for, for employees to go in, we have that ability that, you know, any, any walk of life, any background, uh, you know, there's, there's a spot for it. Um, but for me, specifically within my organization, to me, it, it's the mindset. You know, I, I need to have somebody who can, who can come in and, and be prepared to not just be satisfied with being where we're at, but looking to where we want to get to. So demanding much more creativity from the workforce than in past times and adaptability? A absolutely. And, you know, I think in this day and age, especially in, in the UAS world, um, as you guys all know, the technology, every three days there's new technology, right? I mean, so you have to be able to adapt. You have to be able to be prepared to, to go to that next step. And there might be, you know, for my, like, for instance, for my drone pilots, they might have a drone that they absolutely love because they've flown with it for the last six years. Well, that doesn't mean that the one that's coming out tomorrow might not be better. And sometimes we just have to come to that realization and accept the fact that, there's always something new. There's always, you know, somebody's working on something better and, and more improved, whether it's safer, more efficient, cost effective, uh, whatever that may be. And so just being open to those opportunities. Yeah. Excellent. So, Pauline, how is it different? How is it the same for FarmWise? Yeah, I'd say it, I would echo the mindset. Um, we were just to prepare for the panel because you had sent out this question earlier, we just did the exercise to look into to look into what is our trend, like our hiring pattern, and it looks like we're actually pulling mostly people from smaller companies. And our conclusion toward why do we do that is because I think we're looking for an entrepreneurial spirit, someone like candidates, individuals who can, you know, take initiative, work in autonomy, and also have that ability and that desire to wear many hats and jump on topics that may not be in the job description. And that tends to be, you know, folks who have worked in like smaller organization where you do a little bit of everything. So there is, there is that. Um, so it's more of a technical mindset and uh, a desire to learn very fast and to pick, a, to pick up on things that may not be in like the traditional set of duties that maybe goes with a title. Um, now I would, say, I would say that what are we looking for versus what can we train on the job and what are we looking for? I was sitting on an interview panel debrief two days ago and we fought over this guy doesn't have agricultural background and I was like I'm tired of having that conversation like does the person need to have a background in ag if we're looking for that awesome manager that super technical guy who's very deep and understands various areas of software engineering and has a hard like agricultural experience. We're talking about a unicorn who maybe exists, but there might be like 10 of them in the entire United States. Can like, will we find this person? Is this person available right now? Do they want to join a small company like ours? Do we have the resources to compete with? I mean, no, the answer is no. So. At some point, I think we also, like, it's about knowing what can we, tr you know, I don't think there is anything that, that beats three weeks in Salinas running the machine yourself or shadowing an equipment operator, meeting Dennis, uh, meeting a grower, going around, understanding the growing process. Like, these people are supposed to be smart and, and understand things pretty quickly. Like, they will understand it. So those are things that we're still, like, that example is to say we still struggle to think about like, oh, we often have debates internally on 
what is really needed for the job. Um, and then to your point, um, we have folks who have PhDs on the engineering side, people who are just out of college. Um, we have people from San Jose State um, or Cal Poly. And then we also have you know, folks who are just, you know, didn't get a an high school degree. Um, some went to Hartnell, some people did go to college and are now working in operations, but we have people who like just wanted an opportunity to get training. So we'll see that a lot in our technician, fabricator, equipment operator group. Um, and that is something we like take a lot of pride in is offering training opportunities to the extent we can, right? Um, for instance, for our machine, we need class A licensed driver. Um, up until recently, DMV let us train them, train people on, on the job. So that's something that we've implemented to, you know, increase our chances to train and like retain great employees. So, so uh, that's excellent. Uh, uh, and, and I get the, the, the struggle with the perfect person just isn't available. So then you've got to make choices about what do you hire for, what do you develop internally. So Dennis, with, with Western Growers, as you're looking, you get to see companies like FarmWise who are bringing in this incredible new technology, and you get to see the growers who are trying to incorporate this technology or figure out what technology to incorporate. And, and so how does that, how is this looking to growers and how are they thinking about their workforce needs as they go forward? Well, I think, I, I think everyone does, does recognize it, it's a new day, uh, but it's not a 24 hour day. It's gonna be a longer day. It's a, tra it's, it's a transition. And I, I, I kind of wanted to pick up a little bit on what, what Pauline said. You know, she gave me a look which she said they don't necessarily have to be ag. I, uh, but, um, but it's helpful to be ag where, where, where possible because there's, uh, there's, uh, there's kind of an osmosis factor. And so when you begin to think about what does the new workforce look like, so, some of it is, you know, you raise them young, but, you know, we, you know, from a grower standpoint, we always think we're drinking from a fire hose on all our problems. And so we, we need Work, a workforce now. We need for them to have a workforce now. So this issue of uh, upskilling current workforce is is a conversation I think we need to be very serious about as an industry, and, and frankly, probably even as as a region. Um, but uh, you know, I didn't want to let go because you you know in that in that uh, uh, prep uh, memo that you sent out that Pauline alluded to. You know, what are what are some of the skills? And I and I just wanted to. Um, pass along a couple of thoughts. Uh, we work with a company called Trimble, and one of the things they do are guidance systems. And so the, uh, the person we work with said, and, and I think this is important in terms of, and particularly at a university where people are looking for opportunities, um, he said, listen, the jobs of the future, he said, all economic mobility will be tied into software knowledge, the, the ability to work with software. Um, and, and that's, and that's going to cross over to data analytics and the ability to, to look at things. And then I think the other thing is, and the reason I wanted to pick up on some familiarity with either AGs or skill sets, and Pauline alluded to them, you know, there's some folks training on welding, welding over at Hartnell, Rancho Cielo, uh, the King City uh, High School folks have a great uh, new, new facility. Rumor, rumor has it there are 400,000 job openings for welding. Uh, I think I was a, in a conversation with Clint the other day, and I brought up diesel mechanic, and he said, well, you can't find one. And, and, the, and when you think about where some of the investments have been made, like Megatronics at Hartnell, you go, well, where do, how, how does that make sense? Why is all that at Hartnell when you're talking about computing, engineering, and mechanics? Um, that, that diesel mechanic is this is the setup for sometimes for what Pauline's looking for because then you've got to marry the basic skills with with the tech technology and uh, uh, so I I think um, and and the welding once upon a time Farmwise and a few of the other weeders they don't necessarily make things here and so the welders and the fabricators you want to have a sufficient supply of folks who can 
do the job we we don't want farm wise because one of the things about ag tech it's a global game so people from all over the world are going to come here but they do have to localize their presence somehow now it's not necessarily a salinas valley or a monterey county person uh, but we we want to make sure that workforce is there we don't we don't want farm wise to come into the salinas valley say we're looking for 30 people and we can't find them so so we have so i think we have to think think about that so I, I echo everything they said about the soft skills that speaks to the type of person but i think you know software analytics and some of the basic mechanic issue mechanical skill issues are the setup for uh, computing uh, and engineering and that type of thing. Excellent, thank you. So we've got some questions from the audience here. Um, uh, one of them that's interesting, uh, Pauline, what, where does FarmWise go from here? You've got the weeder out there. What are some of the other tasks that you have targeted and, and what else can, can these robots do? So these robots are just made for weed control today on produce, I would say, the, the range of like things that you'll see grow here. We're interested in broadening the range of crops we can handle. Things like processing tomato is a field we're very interested in that opens up a lot of acres um, outside of Salinas Valley, Central Valley, and so on and so forth. Um, we are not necessarily looking at the space from a task or like vertical perspective. Um, we think there is opportunity for computer vision to really bring more efficiency into every kind of farming processes. Um, I am not sure if we're meant to be a company that builds farming machines forever uh, from head to toe. I think there are people out there who have been doing so for 100 years-ish. And these are the guys who have the big iron type of knowledge. Um, my, my belief is that we should always understand who we are and where do we bring value and what is our core competency and how do we operate in a very lean way um, without you know, trying to do too much. So the, the future I see is more about integrating existing technology into other kinds of farming machine that may, not be, may or may not be built by FarmWise itself. Uh, I also see the future being full of data. Um, I, I think there's an opportunity there to capture agronomic data and make sense of it, not just for an actuation, like application perspective, but maybe from understanding what's going on in the field. Like the example I like to give always is, if you take a, like a, a corn farmer in Iowa, he would like to know what kind of wheat species he has in the field throughout one season so that he can tailor his herbicide program towards it. So understanding like at the species level, like what is the mix you know, is this grasses, are they broadleaf? And hence, what is my chemical mix going to be next year? What has been the performance of my mix for the past few years? So like there's value in historical data and like really adding some predictive analytics to that. So those are also things that we are considering for the future. Excellent, thank you. Um, so Rusty, just a simple question. Does PG, PG and E build or buy your drones? So we buy um, our drones uh, for now. Uh, the, the department, the, the UAV group is growing. Um, the organization, the direction we're going, um, and the amount of different lines of business that we touch within the enterprise is growing. And so the building has, it's, it's come up, but as of right now, we, we buy. We're currently working through um, you know, obviously that there's a big drive to try to get all American made, US made drones. So that's a big push that we have going right now. Um, it's, there's a lot of, a lot of roadblocks in the process. Um, you know, there are, there are foreign made companies, foreign made drones that really have cornered the market and are really good at what they do. And so trying to replace those with US made drones mm -hmm. is, is a bit of a challenge. And so, Though we're buying them, we are currently partnering with um, with U.S.-made drone companies to to develop the you know the the perfect utility drone, uh, you know it's something that can handle the the cameras, the the different sensors that we need, the lidar units, um, FLIR, all the different sensors that we would need to be the perfect utility drone and accomplish all the different work we do. Cool, so. As as make or buy is is always a decision for companies. There's there's also a decision for startups, and this has been really fascinating me lately. Watching companies make a choice about 
Are we going to build these things and sell them, or are we going to build these things and then provide, essentially turn it into a service, which FarmWise has chosen to do and, and Joby has chosen to do, which I think has lots of implications. Let me ask a, a couple of different questions coming off of that. Rusty, the, the drones, are, are, are there any uses of drones within PG&E that are where you're using them as a service, where it's an outside provider who is actually doing the work as a service for PG&E? Yeah, we actually have, I believe right now we're up to about a dozen different um, companies yeah. that are providing service to us for drones. So internally, I have a you know a fairly small team that we specialize in the R and D and focus on on PG&E initiatives, and then we bring in several different services um, that provide services to us. So that's the thing too, is with PG&E, there's, there's employment opportunity, not only you know, whether your paycheck comes from PG&E and it says PG&E right on it, uh, you know, there's a lot of contractors that provide services to us and still um, are funded by PG&E. Mm. And, and another part of that, uh, Pauline, is um, with accessibility. So as we bring in this technology, and it's very expensive technology, um, the ability of small farmers to actually purchase that te technology is not going to be there. But you're providing it as a service. Does, does that make it accessible to smaller farm operations? So we work with all kinds of farm, big and small. Um, it does make it more available, I would say, for smaller growers. There is no small growers in the Salinas Valley, I think, anymore, unless we're talking farmer's market, people who serve like Bay Area farmer's market. Um, so we work with farms who are more on the smaller side, or we're still talking a couple of thousands of <laughs> acres under management. And you know, if we so we're pushing towards a like direct sale model next year. Um, so we'll still be available as a service to a certain extent. So if we if I look at these smaller guys, either they can co-own machines between, let's say, you're a grower contractor for this one brand, and a couple of them own one machine and and you know split the usage like that. Um, and for service, yes, it makes it more accessible to them. Now we are, to, I think up until today, we're not your small farm, like small landowner, hobbyist farmer kind of person. Um, right. Maybe in the future, you know, but not now. Got it, excellent. So um, we're winding kind of toward the end of our time. So I, I, I wanna pose, uh, uh, give you an opportunity to close and, and pose a question within that which is, uh, Dennis a couple of minutes ago made, made reference to, well, this may be a regional issue. Um, and I'm interested in the, what do you see, what would be a challenge you would put out to the region and the community to be doing, thinking about organizing around so that the workforce that is going to be needed, is needed now and is even more going to be needed in the future, is available. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll start from the other end. Uh, well, I, you know, I think, I think the base is guarded from an, an educational standpoint, whether it's community college, um, four years, uh, and then I think you've got a number of strong, let's say, FFA, uh, FFA type types of programs. I think I think the base is guarded in terms of strategy, knowing what to do, commitment to do it. The issue is always, in my mind, and this is, this has been my experience on a lot of things, and uh, is it's seldom not knowing what to do. It's do we have the bandwidth and the mm -hmm. capacity to do it to the degree. We need to get that done. So, so I think you have to have that mindset. And the other thing is, I mean, I was really excited to hear what Joby had to say. I was also really concerned because they need a lot of talent. And so, you know, at, and as Pauline said, hmm, well, if we can't find one we need in the ag, where are we going to go? And you know, so, so I think it's really important to give ser serious thought to, uh, you know, we want to. Uh, have economic opportunity in Monterey County, and particularly, we want to have the right kind of economic opportunity for our, you know, for all the residents of Monterey County. Uh, but, but I think I think we've got to get zero, zeroed on 
what does that look like in terms of beyond skills numbers can we get there because you got to be realistic about that because we're not looking at that i guarantee you she is and that will determine where we're where folks end up and then and then i think the other thing is and you know you asked a question before we came out here do we need new kinds of educational products and i've given that you know and i and i and i've been giving a lot of thought about this i've been fortunate that i've been able to move around the state with the secretary of ag karen ross um, on uh, trying to identify the skill sets and you know and the gaps and who's doing what around next generation um, ag worker and and this issue of upskilling the current workforce now some of that's going to happen i bought something we're going to train them uh, some of it's going to happen the larger companies they have the ability to go hey clint can you do a program for me at heart now that type of thing but there's still an element of, and you know, and I hear this over and over, particularly when there's concerns about the effects of automation and that sort of thing. Is you know, workers want to know what's going on, and uh, and I think if they understood that, they go, well, I'm pretty excited. Do I get a shot at that? So how do we do that? But for instance, if you wander over to the Central Valley, you know, there are 28 different communities over there, and you know, trust me when I tell you, if you're working over in Huron, you're not running over to Reedley to do something that night. You know, so do, do we need a different? Pro do we need an online strategy for how to engage the current workforce? Mm -hmm. Because the current workforce, in my view, is the best bet to begin to build build some numbers. And under all circumstances, they need to be involved. So I'd be thinking about uh, workforce development and then really wrapping our arms around how many folks do we really need? Yeah. yeah. So I, and my how thoughts. do we scale, Pauline? Yeah, quickly, I'll say I would like there is um, value in numbers. So I, I'd love a national nationwide advertising about how sexy it is to work in agriculture uh, that targets people at a very young age. That would be my 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 play. Um, and and aside from that, I think there are amazing like, you know, vocational training or things like that we can think about, you know, if we talk about those very skilled jobs, such as welder, welder fabricator, um, technicians, like we struggle to find technicians, everybody does. How do we make those jobs more desirable? Like, can we talk about that? Like, how, how can we make those jobs more desirable? Is this just compensation? It's never just compensation. So I, I wonder if we can bring a group together and, and think about all of that uh, to attract more talent in this space. Great, thank you. Man, Rusty. Um, I, first off, I, I think Dennis hit one of the key points. If we're talking about current workforce, uh, you know, th this day and age especially, the workforce wants to know. They want to know why we're doing what we're doing. And so we need to develop the workforce that we have now into leaders that are a true, you know, a, a true leader that can develop their own team, right? Develop everybody so that when we do get the opportunities to bring on new employees and new into the workforce, that our existing leaders that have been with the companies for years and years um, have that mindset to help develop our new and coming because in this day and age, I think it is way too easy and we see it way too often that if somebody's not happy with where they're at, they're not getting the answers where they're at, they pick up and they move on. And so if we want to retain this good talent, we have to have those, those leaders and develop our, our workforce. And then real quick, I, I know we're out of time, but I just want to, you know, I think for me, when I look at how we can do and how we can develop our, you know, the future of our workforce is life experience and not being afraid, kind of pushing aside that mindset that because this person maybe has had five jobs, uh, that's a bad thing, right? That they haven't been in the same job for years. Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, if they've moved for the right reasons, uh, you know, and they're constantly wanting to develop themselves and find what they're good at and find what they have a passion for. I think that just develops somebody and having an employee with a background with different work experience, different life experience really helps just bring diversity to the team and, and improves everybody. That's great. Well, I want to invite you all to join me in thanking the panel for their great insights and time. Thank you very much.